Good morning. Uh, warm welcome to Prime Minister Mitsotakis, uh, has been uh, in the US uh, twice uh, the last weeks, uh, also been back uh, to uh, Greece. Uh, it is a great pleasure for us to have you uh, back with us uh, in uh, Davos. Uh, thank you for your leadership on behalf of your uh, country. Uh, transforming the Greece economy has been uh, key. And um, I think confidence, I know confidence now, is back uh, in the economy of your country. Not uh, an easy task. Someone had uh, to do this job. And also in the EU, uh, we know that uh, you personally and Greece uh, is again very much uh, listened to and seen as a critical partner in the European um, Union. And also your uh, recent visits uh, to the U.S. show real partnership between you personally, uh, Prime Minister, uh, President uh, Biden, and also your leadership uh, now um, after the war uh, in Ukraine. Maybe uh, let's um, first say uh, two words uh, on the war uh, in uh, Ukraine. How much of uh, historic change is that for Europe and uh, for uh, the EU. The theme of our meeting uh, is at the historic tur uh, turning point. And uh, will this change Europe forever? It is a historic uh, uh, turning point, uh, and I think a whole period which essentially started uh, in 1990 with the collapse of communism is clearly coming um, uh, to, to an end. Uh, it has already changed um, uh, Europe. Uh, Europe has proven to be extremely united and quick uh, in imposing unprecedented sanctions uh, uh, on, uh, on Russia. It has rekindled the transatlantic uh, relationship. It has given uh, NATO a new purpose. And it is also pushing Europe to think much more strategically about this concept of strategic autonomy, which uh, I was uh, uh, a big fan of uh, before the uh, Russian invasion uh, into Ukraine. If you look at energy, for example, uh, we were already the most ambitious continent in terms of reaching climate neutrality by 2050. Now we have an additional reason to do so, and that is to reduce our dependence on Russian hydrocarbons as quickly as possible. So we have to focus more on renewables. Uh, we have to uh, diversify our uh, sources of hydrocarbons in the short term. And Greece has a very important role to play uh, in that discussion, given the fact that we are uh, a key um, uh, partner in the Eastern Mediterranean. And the Eastern Mediterranean in itself is an area of strategic interest, both for Europe, but also for the United States. So um, you, Prime Minister, also um, were uh, quite historic in, in D.C. I don't know when last or Prime Minister from uh, Greece uh, addressed uh, joint ses sessions for the U.S. Congress. No, never, never. <laughs> no. Well, it was it was uh, it was a first, and certainly it was uh, an honor uh, for me, an honor for the country. As you know, these um, um, speeches in front of a joint uh, session of Congress uh, don't happen very frequently. But it was an opportunity for me, first of all, to celebrate the paths of our two democracies to speak about the past, uh, the influence of Athenian democracy on the founding fathers of the American Revolution, uh, and uh, also the influence that uh, uh, America had on our war of independence. But of course, we also spoke a lot about uh, uh, the present and the future. We have a very strong strategic partnership uh, with uh, the United States, which is not just focused on, uh, on defense. It is expanding to energy. For example, the port of Alexandropolis in northeastern Greece uh, is acquiring uh, a very profound strategic importance uh, for the diversification of energy supply, not just for Greece, but also for the Balkans. If we want to replace Russian gas in the Balkans, the easiest way to do it is to bring LNG into northern Greece and then um, um, uh, pipe the gas uh, into the Balkan uh, markets. And of course, 
This trip was also about the economic partnership between our two countries. It was an opportunity for me to explain how Greece has changed over these past uh, three years, to make the case that uh, the Greece that many remember, the Greece uh, of big deficits, uh, a, Greece, a Greece that was actually um, still sort of controlled by, uh, uh, by, by programs uh, no longer exists. And uh, uh, it, it was funny because when I, when I went to Washington to meet President Trump in, in January 2020, we were still discussing as to when and how I, I should visit the IMF. Now there was no discussion about me visiting the IMF. It was unnecessary because Greece has repaid its loans to the IMF two years ahead of schedule. So maybe this is the best uh, indication of how the country has actually changed over the past three years. But how could this uh, economic miracle happen so fast? I, I think uh, it was said that it would take decades before uh, the Greek economy could really rebound. W what measures uh, was taken and why did it happen accelerate uh, so fast, this is like nothing well, succeeds. First of like all, it success. was um, you know a drastic change in policy. We always made the argument that the previous government had overtaxed the, the real economy, uh, and the more you tax the real economy, the more you drive down growth. Uh, our job was to um, uh, put Greece on a high growth trajectory and do it primarily through investment, domestic and foreign investment, and we we have succeeded in that uh, on that front. Uh, I was looking at the recent OECD numbers which show that Greece has the largest uh, reduction in terms of the tax wedge uh, uh, in, in, in the OECD countries over the past um, uh, years. But we, do, we were doing this without endangering uh, our fiscal sustainability path. Because the economy is growing much faster than we had anticipated, this is also um, providing the state budget with more um, uh, revenues. At the same time, we completely transformed uh, um, the, the regulatory environment in Greece and we digitized the state. So we reduced bureaucracy. Uh, Greeks are very happy that they can now interact with uh, the Greek state uh, through their um, mobile phone or through their computer rather than standing in queues and, and being quote unquote harassed by Greek um, uh, bureaucracy. Um, uh, SNP has upgraded the Greek economy a month ago after the Ukrainian invasion, um, we will be done with enhanced supervision in August, a very important uh, milestone. The decision has been taken, and we hope that Greece will reach investment status, uh, investment grade uh, at some point uh, uh, in uh, in 2023. And that will be the you know the final. That's the final nut that we need to uh, that we need to to crack. But no one is concerned about Greece now. Uh, if you compare Greece 10 years ago in 2012 to Greece in 2022. Uh, we are a confident uh, country, a resilient country. We fought populism. We defeated uh, the populist rhetoric because we proved that we can do the job much better. And as we will be entering, you know, uh, we'll have elections in 2023. Uh, this is a case we'll be making to the Greek people. We actually delivered. We delivered on our commitments. We created jobs. We, uh, we, um, uh, uh, we increased disposable income. We increased the minimum wage by 10%. We still recognize that wages are low in Greece, so we want to make sure that the growth we drive is a growth, is a growth that reduces income inequality. I'm very preoccupied with this uh, issue. We cannot go, go on and tell our young people that they will live a, a worse uh, life than their parents. And if we don't offer the young people the opportunity to participate in this, uh, in this growth, we will end up repeating the mistakes of the past. So you were uh, able to reduce uh, the taxes that was hurting growth and investments uh, the most, created growth, and then you could still secure a uh, redistribution of wealth and also wealth uh, trickling down. Talking about uh, tax uh, reductions, one of the challenges in the past, at least, was also that uh, the taxes were there, but they were not being uh, paid. Uh, is it more understanding now with uh, a more competitive tax system that at least you have to pay the two, taxes. Two points on this. This is interesting uh, because when we, we offered uh, companies a lot of support during COVID uh, and uh, we did so, I think, in, in the proper way uh, because our, our main priority was to make sure that we protected jobs and we succeeded in doing that. Unemployment was at 17% when we came into power. It's, you know, it's going to be under 12% very soon. Uh, but the way we did it is we looked at uh, the reported income of companies. So companies that were tax evading were not getting help from the government. And when they complained, I told them, well, tough luck. 
um, uh, maybe you'll, you'll learn your lesson um, uh, for the future. Uh, at the same time, the more we drive digital, the more transactions are, uh, are you know, take place uh, electronically, the less tax evasion you have. So our, one of the important reforms of the past decade was that our revenue service is now completely independent. They have much better know-how. They use technology much more um, uh, effectively to go after tax evaders. So this is also allowing us to be able to um, increase, um, uh, increase revenues uh, uh, and fight uh, tax evasion, which is always a big problem in Greece. And um, coming back to, your, um, uh, to the more regional politics and, and global politics, you, you went to Washington, uh, D.C., and also uh, met with uh, President Biden. But I, I just read in the news that your neighbor, President Erdogan, doesn't want to pick up the phone when you call him. <laughs> well, uh, I remember after March 2020 when Turkey tried to weaponize migration uh, and send tens of thousands of desperate people across the Greek border, and we said no when we defended the border of Greece, uh, and we brought the leadership of the European Union to the Greek-Turkish border. Uh, President Erdogan was saying the same things. He doesn't want to talk to me. So uh, maybe he'll change his mind, but uh, uh, again, but at the end of the day, uh, on a more serious note, we're neighbors, we always need to, uh, to talk, and we always want to keep channels of communication open. We're never going to be the ones who will not talk to our neighbors. On the other hand, if President Erdogan thinks that uh, I will not defend uh, you know, the sovereignty and the sovereign rights uh, of Greece, and I will not make the case to the international audience that Turkey is behaving as a revisionist power, then he's wrong. Because uh, what we've seen, uh, unfortunately, over the past two months is uh, I went to, um, uh, to Istanbul and had a meeting with President Erdogan. And it was, I, think, I thought it was a good meeting. But then you know, a month later, we saw an unprecedented number of uh, overflights over our Greek uh, islands. And this behavior is completely unacceptable. And I will raise that issue whenever, ca whenever I can until Turkey uh, changes its uh, behavior. No, it, it had uh, real consequences for the Russians, then they, 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 they flew over Turkey, didn't it? Well, uh, you know, we've been dealing with overflights for, uh, you know, for many, many years. Now, m many of our uh, you know, colleagues in, uh, you know, in, in Sweden and Finland realize that, you know, how, how problematic this type of behavior is. And speaking of Finland and Sweden, I want to be absolutely clear, we've supported from the very beginning unequivocally their membership into NATO. And I think it is a mistake. Uh, if Turkey continues to use uh, these negotiations uh, to extract uh, sort of uh, benefits for, um, um, uh, for its own uh, national uh, interest. This is a time when we all need to be united. Uh, it is important that NATO is going to um, be strengthened by the addition of, of two countries. And frankly, uh, the last thing that we need now within NATO is another source of geopolitical instability uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. So that's why it's important uh, to, to, uh, to have a, a period of, uh, of calm and, uh, uh, and stability, but we're never the ones um, who raise tensions. Uh, I think you were in D.C. almost at the same time as the Swedish uh, Prime Minister. Yes, I was there, I was there uh, two days before the Swedish and the Finnish, and the uh, Finnish uh, the president, president yeah. Yeah. Uh, was uh, there. Uh, you also have been talking about uh, the role uh, of uh, Europe now post the Ukrainian um, war. Uh, I just listened to Prime Minister Rutte that spoke in another uh, meeting, and he said that uh, Europe uh, cannot stay as uh, the playing field. We have to start to be the players, and Europe should be uh, on pair with China and uh, the U.S. We're the largest market in the world. Do you agree in that I do. perspective? I, I, I do, but then we need to think uh, smartly about what, that does, what does that mean. Uh, on defense, we need to do more. Uh, we have been, uh, uh, as I told you, proponents of the concept of European strategic autonomy before the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, we need to spend more, but we also need to spend more smartly. Uh, we need to um, look at our defense systems and have more interoperability. Uh, the defense industry in Europe is, uh, frankly, uh, too fragmented um, uh, now. Uh, and uh, there will be times uh, when it is necessary for Europe to act on its own without uh, possibly the participation of NATO. NATO will always be the bedrock 
uh, of transatlantic um, uh, stability and it is the most successful uh, alliance uh, in, in the world. Uh, and we, if we strengthen our strategic autonomy, we're strengthening NATO. The more we invest in our defense capabilities, the more resources we put at NATO's disposal. But we also need to look at what we've done in terms of the strategic compass, which is an important document, and be aware that we will have um, interests of, uh, of our own as, uh, as a European Union. And then, of course, uh, energy, I think, is going to be the critical um, um, battleground in the short term, in the medium term, in the long term. We can be leaders in terms of the energy transition. We can be leaders. We should be leaders uh, in renewables. We should be leaders in the new technologies um, uh, around, uh, uh, around climate change. In the short term, we need to diversify uh, away from Russian uh, uh, gas. But we also need to be aware of the fact that uh, currently we are getting squeezed. We're paying to Russia prices of gas which are exorbitant. And they do not reflect the fundamentals uh, of the gas market. And that is why I've been a proponent uh, of the idea of some sort of um, a wholesale price cap um, uh, for the gas market in Europe. And I will bring back this uh, suggestion at the level of the European um, uh, Council. We need to do it, of course, by working also with the Americans because they're big providers of, of LNG. And there are smart ideas on how we can actually do this. But I don't want to put ourselves in a situation where we spend more and more subsidizing our electricity and our gas bills uh, domestically, and the European Union uh, does not support us uh, in, in this effort. It's important to invest in the future, and that is why the Repower EU initiative uh, is, I think, a great addition to the next generation uh, EU as a financial tool that will help us uh, invest uh, in the green transition. But we also need to look at what we're going to do tomorrow, next month, the next three months. What are we going to do in the, uh, in the winter in terms of being able to support uh, our people? We've come up with what I think is a very strong domestic package um, to support households and businesses uh, when it comes to electricity prices. But frankly, Europe should do more on that front. But it will end uh, in Europe having to close down several industry plants, aluminium, fertilizers, etc., if there is not uh, electricity uh, there, I guess. Well, uh, I mean, of course, we need to prepare for the, um, uh, for the worst uh, uh, case um, uh, scenario. But these are going to be pretty, what you describe, uh, are pretty you know, dramatic uh, developments because we use gas for three reasons. We gas for manufacturing, we use gas for heating, that's going to be very important in the winter, and we use gas for electricity production. Uh, in Greece, we use more gas in the summer than we do in the winter simply because we have more air conditioning um, uh, requirements. But um, thinking uh, also then uh, about uh, the huge business opportunities that are related also to the green transition. I think those so-called freedom fuels being the uh, new uh, renewables, have we, there is still huge potential there. But as you said, Prime Minister, we also have to prepare for short term and medium term. It's, yeah, it's not but, built overnight. But uh, you're right to point out that renewables uh, are right now the cheapest form of energy we can produce. Um, you know, there, you know, maybe you know, for the first time in Greece in, in April, at some point we reached a point. It was a, you know a sunny sunny day, with lots of wind and with energy consumption not being that high, where we produced our entire uh, uh, you know uh, uh, energy electricity supply from from wind and uh, wow. and solar. And this is really uh, this is a future. So we will add uh, renewable uh, capacity, but we need to accelerate the permitting process. It cannot take us five years to set up, uh, uh, you know, uh, a wind farm or a solar plant, and uh, that is why you know the European initiatives, in terms of streamlining permitting, the idea of having go-to areas w where you can actually go and build renewable capacity at a much faster pace uh, are so important. But that's not going to do the trick on its own. You need storage, um, and storage technologies. We need to really invest in storage technologies. Uh, we can look at pump storage, which countries such as Greece, which have uh, uh, the geography to support it, uh, we are uh, uh, placing significant funds from the RRF uh, to, to build the first pump storage uh, capacities, of, of course batteries, and then grids. Um, our grids right now are not able to, um, uh, to, to support the influx of renewables. And interconnectivity. We want to build an electricity cable that will connect Greece and Egypt. 
it's going to be a three gigawatt cable. That's very important because we can bring in the European market very cheap solar uh, uh, electricity that's going to be produced in, uh, in Egypt. So if you want to have a properly functioning um, um, European market, we need to do all of those and we need to focus uh, on, uh, uh, on energy savings uh, because uh, uh, you know, little changes in our habits, if all of, all of European consumers do them, they really add up to a lot. And you know, sometimes there is skepticism when we talk about energy saving, you know, we we'll tell people maybe you, know, you raise the temperature in your air conditioning by one or two uh, degrees. It does actually make a big difference. They will end up paying lower bills. For example, we're launching a, a program now where we're subsidizing the replacement of old uh, air conditioning units for houses and businesses. The new electricity units are you know, 50%, 60% more efficient when it comes to their electricity consumption. So I'm a, I, I really would like us to place more uh, uh, emphasis uh, on, uh, on uh, 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 making sure we spend uh, less and uh, less energy than we uh, than we currently consume at the European level. Well, thank you so much for this. I, I heard you also uh, last night speak about energy, and I think it's uh, very comforting uh, to know that we have leaders in Europe that does know the field in well, depth we were, because it's a, it's we a complicated. To, we, we, you know, none of us knew a lot about energy before we came into uh, in, into office, but this is. This is complicated, the energy market. Every country has different priorities, but uh, I will really sort of urge our colleagues um, uh, to look at you know, the, uh, the, the big picture uh, right now. We did it with COVID. Uh, we did it with, uh, um, uh, with next generation EU, so we did it with vaccines. We're doing it with Repower uh, EU, but let's look at also at the short-term um, problem. Um, which we which we have uh, because we may have a difficult you know difficult winter ahead of us. Uh, I'll, uh, we'll move to some other topics, but uh, just reflecting on the energy situation that Europe is in now, 40% of the natural gas came uh, and come from Russia. In hindsight, how much of a cardinal mistake was it to put that many eggs uh, in the Kremlin basket when? Uh, we saw Georgia, we saw uh, Crimea, uh, we've seen uh, all this, and uh, we took a high risk. Secretary General uh, of NATO, Ian Stoltenberg, said yesterday we had made a priority of the economy and we should have uh, put uh, freedom and uh, independence first. Yes, that's true. Uh, and in retrospect, it was a, a mistake, but one should not uh, uh, also uh, forget that for many European countries, especially big manufacturing countries, having access to very cheap you know, Russian gas made a difference in their competitiveness. And what we also know now is that not all of us were paying the same price for the same gas. At least if we were paying all the same price, we could argue that we all had the same benefit. Uh, this was not the case. So that is why it is important that these decisions are actually taken at the, uh, at the European level. So, uh, coming back to also uh, the geopolitical role of um, Europe and the EU, uh, you said that uh, Europe also has to take more responsibility for its own uh, security. 80% uh, of the military capacity of NATO is outside the EU. Mm -hmm. Well, Greece has been spending more than 2%. Uh, on defense for quite some time for obvious reasons because we have legitimate security um, uh, concerns. So the first thing we need to do is to make sure that uh, we raise our overall level of spending, but again, we need to do it in a smarter way. And there are clear areas where we can cooperate, where we need European capability. Cyber is one example, for example. Space may be another, uh, where it does, just does not make sense for you know, a country, a medium-sized country such as Greece to uh, invest uh, uh, on, its, uh, on its own. Uh, so uh, what you describe is very much a reality, and that's why NATO is always going to be, is, is continue to be, will continue to be very, uh, very important. But if at some point we need to take a decision at the European level, will we be able to deliver? And of course, there are also uh, other issues which have to do with, uh, uh, with our security. Let me just raise one, border management. Um, this is very important. Um, uh, we cannot have a properly functioning Schengen zone if we don't uh, uh, make sure that we control who comes in and out of the European Union, and we've done so um, with full respect to human rights, 
but we are defending our borders uh, and uh, we want to make sure we attack the, uh, the, the criminal gangs of illegal smugglers that are, are benefiting from, um, uh, from human uh, pain and suffering. If we want to do um, have, uh, so we, we want organized migration. There is labor shortage now in, 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 in Europe. There is labor shortage in Greece with 12% unemployment. So if we need, um, you know, for example, agricultural or construction workers and we can get them, let's do organized, you know, organized deals with other countries rather than encouraging people to, you know, to cross the Aegean in horrible and very dangerous uh, circumstances. This is also a critical element uh, of our security. We don't talk much about it, but I can tell you as a, as a, as a border uh, country, we're very preoccupied with this issue. And, and we saw uh, the same um, situation unfolding between Belarus and, uh, and Poland too, so it's probably... Yeah, because we, uh, you know, the, the playbook was written by others there, uh, and we've, uh, we've seen how dangerous it is to, to weaponize uh, migrants and refugees uh, for geopolitical purposes, and we simply cannot allow this to, to, to happen again. Let's at um, the end of this uh, conversation, I wish we had uh, more time, talk about uh, European uh, values and also uh, the journey that Greece has been on when it uh, became a member of the European uh, Union. Uh, maybe uh, not everything was perfect, but the European Union wanted to integrate Spain, Portugal, Greece, and it's been very uh, it's been successful. successful. Yeah. And now these countries are uh, leaders, and as you also mentioned, Prime Minister, the travel of Greece has been uh, into a real uh, democracy, been tough uh, 10 last uh, years. But uh, one thing is in the neighborhood of uh, the EU, there are challenges, but there's also uh, conflicts inside uh, the EU because not all EU countries uh, do stick uh, to all the key uh, accords and, and the principles of the EU. Uh, do you think one has been too complacent about that and needs to be tougher in the years well, to come? First of all, the European Union has been transformative for Greece. Uh, since we joined, uh, uh, we, we've, we've benefited uh, tremendously um, financially. We also became complacent at some point uh, and uh, we paid a very heavy price. Uh, but Greece stayed within the Eurozone, and it was the right decision. Um, uh, and, uh, and now we're happy that we're again doing um, uh, rather well. Uh, but uh, the European values uh, and the democratic values uh, are you know, part of who we are as a, uh, as a country, and that is why this concept of sort of reinventing democracy in the 21st century uh, is uh, so important, and that is why w there can be no discount when it comes to issues uh, of rule of law, of making sure we confine uh, to the European uh, acquis. This, at the end of the day, is who we are. That's what we signed up to when we joined the um, uh, European Union. And at the same time, we need to recognize that many of the grievances that uh, fuel populism and add to the toxicity of the public debate are legitimate grievances. Income inequality is a huge issue. Uh, we cannot afford to, uh, to ignore it, and that is why when we think about Greece's sort of long-term growth, we don't want to mistake, repeat the mistakes of the past. We want an inclusive uh, growth, and we also need to, to, to see how we, um, uh, how we moderate you know, the, the political debate uh, in, uh, in the public uh, space, how we reduce toxicity. We're leaders when it comes to regulation uh, of the digital, uh, uh, of, of the digital uh, ecosystem, but we can do more, more to work also with the big, you know, tech companies uh, to, to make sure that hate speech, misinformation, disinformation, does not become, uh, you know, a part of, uh, of, um, uh, you know, of the, uh, of, of the online dialogue. Because unfortunately, that is what we have to, to deal with. And sort of one, one last point: uh, if the political dialogue is so toxic. Uh, 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 if uh, you know it's all about personal attacks, think of the next generation of, of leaders who will want to join politics if they have to go through this. Um, you know, having to deal with uh, character assassinations, attacks on their families. So we risk really um, uh, sending a signal to the next generation of leaders that it's not worthwhile um, um, entering politics because simply the, the price you pay is just too high. 
Well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Prime Minister. No discounts when it comes to basic values. And also, thank you again uh, for your leadership, a rebounding of the uh, Greek economy, but that also has meant a rebounding of uh, Greece, both in the European Union, uh, in Europe, but also after your historical uh, speech well, it's good. for bo both of the chambers uh, of the of the. Well, it's uh, good to be back in. Uh, good, good to be physically back in uh, in Davos. Yeah, forward. thank you. Being, We're happy. Being, being, being back in, in in January. Happy to see you, and uh, thank you thank for you. this uh, great conversation. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thanks again. Very much. Thank you.